in many ways, what the next two days are about are about stories that took place and were started during a period of the city's history when John Lindsay was mayor. And as long as we're going to talk about stories, I think it's important um, to tell you a little bit about the story of Baruch College and its genesis. In the early 1840s, the city leaders of the city of New York try to imagine how they were going to maintain the growth of the city and continue to develop it as a major world place of commerce and economic development. And they decided that the only way to make this happen was to create the ability to educate whole generations of young people who, for lack of economic resources, would not be able to go to college or a university. At the time, in the 40s, there were only two universities in New York. It was Columbia and a new upstart on the lower end of Manhattan called NYU. And so the city fathers created what was called the, Earth, the Free Academy on the corner of 23rd Street and Lexington Avenue. And that institution, which was created in, in large part to provide educational opportunities to talented young people in the city, became, over the course of time, the City University of New York. And the City Un University of New York today is the largest urban university system in the United States, only dwarfed by two state university systems, the University of California and the State University of New York. There are over 250,000 students who go to the City University of New York through, who, to earn associate degrees in its community colleges or to get baccalaureate degrees or graduate degrees through its senior colleges and graduate center. It is the commitment of the City University and, and, and its scale that is reflective of New York, of New York's ability to dream big and on a scale that is often uh, unimaginable by other urban um, governments. In fact, that's one of the things about New York is the scale at which things are done. When um, Lindsay came into office. I was all of 25 years old. In fact, one of the things that's interesting about many of the people who were involved during that period was our youth. I was on the faculty of the City, Uni of the City College of New York's Engineering School and was captured in large part by the messages that John Lindsay was talking about. I approached the Dean of Engineering of the engineering school at that time and suggested that we ought to get involved with New York. We were analytical, we were problem solvers, and that wouldn't that be a wonderful role for the university? And I got looked at like I was crazy. But the inspiration, the message that uh, was invoked by John Lindsay inspired a whole generation of people. And in fact, one of the, one of the themes that Bernard Baruch, who we are named after, often talked about as a major business leader and as an individual who spent almost his entire life uh, in public service said, when he talked about the role of government and big business, he talked about them as instruments for creating opportunities for people, for creating pathways so that people could strive to achieve the American dream. That ability to talk about people, to talk about people's aspirations, that ability to talk about creating opportunities for improving one's life, for creating a livable city, was a message that John Lindsay often delivered. I've always believed that the broad array of innovations undertaken during the eight years of the Lindsay administration contributed greatly to the field of public management, which I have now spent the last 40 years of my life practicing. Through the experience and knowledge of the people who worked in that administration that they then took to other parts of their careers, they fertilized many different fields and changed a lot of the ways we think about practicing business. There were many experiments that were tried during that period, and I think it's often 
worthwhile reminding ourselves that we really don't operate with perfect information. That the idea of trying to change things to make things better don't guarantee that they're going to work. But what is important is the motivation behind those efforts to make change. Whether they're self-serving or whether they really are intended to improve other people's lives. So it's the stories of these efforts that we want to kind of explore over the next two days. And we want to capture because they are an important part of our history. I believe that one of the key reforms of the Lindsay years related to this focus on analysis of public programs. And in fact, one of the mantras from that period was the idea of uh, data-driven decision-making, about thinking about using data to kind of reveal patterns about how things worked and didn't work, and then making decisions that would attempt to improve it. Today, when we think about data-driven decision-making, we think about huge amounts of data in the gigabits and huge numbers that are hard sometimes to imagine, and about doing computing where we drill down into data to find patterns about the way in which things work in order to be able to make timely decisions to adapt to change. It's hard to imagine when we think about computing today to reflect back to the 60s and what the technology that was available for the things we tried to do were. We kind of take for granted today that we have a cell phone that allow us to call anywhere in the world, that allow us from the same phone to walk around with thousands of songs and videos on this little device, or to link up to the internet in which we can have conversations with people um, in real time. That's not what it was like in the 50s and the 60s. In fact, um, growing up in the city of New York, the big technology in the 50s was radio. So I think it's important when we try to look back 45 years and try to understand the challenges that confronted the people who were involved in trying to create change during the Lindsay years, and to understand the challenges that John Lindsay himself faced, is to take and remind ourselves what the 50s and 60s were really like, and not what we kind of think we remember them to be like. The 50s was an era of many challenges. Just to remind you briefly, internationally, we were in the middle of a Cold War, and we fought the Korean War. There was the spread of nuclear capability, with the Russians exploding a hydrogen bomb. There was a space race, with the Russians launching Sputnik and testing its first ICBM capable of delivering nuclear warheads and minutes to the United States. It was an age of the nuclear deterrent. There was the second Arab-Israeli war um, in response to Egypt taking over its Suez Canal from the British, and so the Israelis, British, and French marched into Egypt to take it back. Old colonies of the British and French were beginning to fight for their independence. The first Americans died in Vietnam, and Castro rose to power in Cuba. At home, Senator McCarthy was looking for communists everywhere. Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus, and Governor Forbes refused to admit black students into um, Little Rock Central High School, resulting in the National Guard coming to force their admissions. Martin Luther King formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Urban renewal created tensions in cities as poor neighborhoods were demolished in the name of development, and the Cross Bronx Expressway was completed, dividing the Bronx in half. Bobby Thompson hit a home run that was heard around the world, and the Giants and the Dodgers moved to California. It was the beginning of the baby boom. Sabin developed the live polio vaccine. There was an unknown DJ in, in Cleveland by the name of Alan Freed, who coined the phrase rock and roll music. The first commercial computer was put on the market by Remington Rand, a typewriter company called the Univac. And its first claim to fame was it was used to calculate and predict the winner of the 1952 presidential election. The 60s were a fairly tumultuous time. 
John F. Kennedy was assassinated, which led to Lyndon B. Johnson's becoming president and launching the Great Society that poured money into federal and local programs to fight the war on poverty. These efforts led to the creation of Medicare, Medicaid, the Office of Economic Opportunity, and many more. The Voting Rights Act was passed. The Civil Rights Act was passed. But the hope of the Great Society was dashed with the upheaval that resulted in our involvement in Vietnam. Peter Jennings and Tom Brewer, in their encyclopedia book entitled Century, talks about the 60s as a time when the establishment generation was fighting with the counterculture. <coughs> young against old, adults versus students, parents versus children, even men against women as the divorce rate soared. A decade that began with the election of JFK and a promise of an American Camelot ended with a country torn apart by a tragic, senseless war 12,000 miles away. A civil rights struggle that had gone from nonviolent protests to devastating urban riots, a Cold War that had de become embodied and symbolized by building of the, of the Berlin Wall, an epidemic of illegal drugs used by both the urban poor and the disinfected middle class youth as their way of tranquilizing themselves from pain. JFK's launching of the Peace Corps, which tapped the energy of Americans' youth to help conquer disease, poverty, and illiteracy in developing countries, the very same youth who violently protested the Democratic Convention in Chicago in 1968, the murder in 1968 of two leaders, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. This was not an easy time. In the midst of all of this, John Lindsay was elected mayor in 1965 to take office in 1966. And what he brought with him were young people from all over the United States who had, who had an idealism that was born from the Civil Rights Movement and who were inspired by JFK's challenge to discover what they could do for their country. These college graduates had many skills that previous generations didn't possess. This was the beginning of an era of using computers to analyze data and the application of systems thinking and management science applications the problems of delivering public services was just emerging as a field. But these problems that these bright young recruits by the Lindsay, John Lindsay to turn New York into a livable city faced were more intractable than those of the early 60s when the issues related to overturning unfair laws and giving everyone black and white alike their long denied rights. By 1966, there was a cynicism among northern blacks that was born from the more subtle and insidious form of racism, the kind that deprived jobs and housing through the wink of an eye and an elbow to the ribs. Watts and Detroit and Newark were declarations that there were two levels of racism at work in America, the kind of legal barriers that the southern blacks had begun to remove and the more elusive economic and social barriers that were the bane of, northern, of urban north where discrimination declarations declared itself through the class discrimination more than by laws. In the middle of the 60s, I was in California, and I'll never forget having spent a day on Catalina Island watching television monitors of Watts burning and being on the ferry coming back to uh, Long Beach, being warned that if I drove on the Long Beach Expressway, which is the way I had to drive to get home, that I had to be careful of marauders riding up and down the freeway shooting people. It was not a comfortable feeling. These were very deep conflicts and wounds in urban America that were captured in the headline on the front page of the New York Herald Tribune on January 25, 1965. New York, the greatest city in the world, and everything that is wrong with it. Given this context, what did the new mayor, John Lindsay, do to correct these wrongs? A key element of John Lindsay's efforts to reform New York City government was hiring Fred Hayes as his budget director. Hayes recognized that a critical tool to improving both the decision-making process and the management of public programs and services required information and increased abilities to communicate and, and coordinate activities across city agencies. When Fred Hayes left uh, city government, in fact, those of you who, who know Fred, 
often were bewildered when you had conversations with Fred because it was never clear which conversation you were actually having with him because I, as I discovered, he would often process multiple conversations simultaneously. But one of the things that Fred did have was the ability to kind of capture ideas and, and themes and put them in writing in, some, in a very clear, concise way. And so when Fred left um, the budget division in city government, he wrote about his experience. And I want to just read something from what, um, one of his writings. So he was talking about the, what they found when they came in, into the city. The initial prob problem is ignorance. The several and important program areas where we, in truth, do not know what to do. The traditional wisdom of the professionals in education, in health, and in law enforcement has failed to produce program judgments and designs that adequately educate underprivileged children, provide satisfactory health care at reasonable costs, or, go, or give the citizens sufficient protection against crime. We know surprisingly little about what we are doing and what we have done in major program areas. Millions of dollars have been expended on pilot experimental programs without adequate controls, reporting, or evaluation. Few government agencies or programs have made provisions for data or program operations and performance for analysis of program impact and results or for program evaluation. The problem is broader. Until relatively recently, nowhere else were significant resources going into research on these problems. The federal government has poured extensive funds into the search for cures for cancer, polio, and heart disease, into the design of nuclear reactors for power production, into space, problem, into space travel problems, but only a minute amount into the problems that would constitute an urban research agenda today. During the administration of John Lindsay, extensive investments were made into the developing and implementing innovative ways to improve the management and operation of the city government. Among the management innovations were the introduction of program planning and budgeting, the establishment of the New York City Iran Institute to conduct policy and operation reviews, introduction of project management techniques, citywide creation of a productivity program, the attraction and creation of personnel systems to bring people to the city. This was a dynamic time, and over the next two days, we hope to kind of unfold the stories of what that time was like. One of the purposes of these retrospectives and these reflections is to try and figure out what it meant, and once we understand what it meant, what it can mean for the next generation that is going to face challenges equally big or greater, what can you draw from the tools we used, what can you learn from the mistakes we made, and what are the broad themes here? So I'm going to start by just underlining for everybody in the room the scope of the challenges that the next generation is going to face, just how big it is. As we are sitting here, it's very hard to understand in this nice wood-paneled room. It's very quiet, it's very dignified. We've all had our coffee and our rolls. There are, what, 20, 30 groups out there trying to get a hold of a dirty nuke and set it off in a western city. That will probably happen in the next three to five to seven years. It may be Chicago, it may be Munich. That is a challenge. And that is a challenge those who decide to go into public life in the next generation will face. There's another one that's very large. That is a squeeze of climate change, falling water tables, and decreasing food productivity. It's almost a perfect storm of three forces meeting. That has now begun. You can perceive by looking at the figures the, be the beginning of significant trend lines. That will continue unless and until we reverse it. We have about probably five to 10 years maximum to reverse it. Now, why do I start with problems that have nothing to do with John Lindsay and are not particularly problems uh, unique to the city of New York. Because I believe that the kind of tools and the kind of political backing and the kind of spirit that underlay the years of the Lindsay government, which were also years of great turbulence, but were years of great challenge, are in fact the kind of devotion and dedication and large ambitious sense of what we can do together in the public sector when we have confidence in ourselves and the will to try a measure of what can be done that way. And if we do not think that daringly, and if we do not collect that wide a range of tools and that larger pool of talent, then these much larger challenges we face now 
are going to beat us and we're not going to master them. So since I promised to be short, let me take what I think are some of the themes. First of all, for those of you for whom this sounds like all ancient history, Lindsay, government, 60s, 70s, what the hell is all that? I'm going to give you my broad, crude sense of what it was. It was a period when a man, the mayor of New York, and the team he gathered around him and the circumstances of the time combined to introduce a period of great change and introduce themes of government and analysis, some of which, many of which, continue right through to the city's administration today. I can draw a line. It's not a straight line. It's a wavy line. But I can draw a line from John Lindsay to the administration of Michael Bloomberg. I can draw it in several ways. And I think you'll see as today's and tomorrow's panels go on how that, uh, how, how that line is drawn. The Lindsay government was a government that said a couple of very simple things and then tried imperfectly by all governments to carry it out. First of all, it said, we're not all on a level playing field in this city. There are large and important groups of people, particularly blacks and Puerto Ricans, but not only blacks and Puerto Ricans, who don't have equal access, don't have an equal shot at the good things in life, and we are going to level that playing field. Sounds rather simple today in 2010, doesn't it? Wasn't so simple then. It was, in fact, a mini-revolution in the way things happened in this city. Second of all, what that era said was, if we are tougher, if we are more analytically oriented, if we pay attention to execution as well as to pretty words, we can actually change some of the forces and institutions that are holding us back. And there were a lot of success stories, and there were some pretty sensational failures when we <laughs> fell right on our ass. But there were both, and my point is, because of the seas you guys are sailing into, my point to remember is that group of which I was a part thought big, dared greatly, and was willing to aim for the horizon and was willing to incur the risk of great political backlash and wrath sometime in the pursuit, in the goal of meeting the real problems. So what are some of the other watch, watch words I would draw out of this? You've heard a lot about Fred Hayes, a man who's not with us this morning. This was a giant. One of the reasons this all worked and one of the reasons that impetus for change began in the Budget Bureau was because of a combination of the man, the office, his relationship with the mayor, and the Times. By the Times, I mean it was a time of hope and confidence in the US. You were coming out of the Kennedy years, and there was a sense we can do things, we can improve these crazy urban systems that are strangling us and suffocating us. Second of all, the man, Hayes was a polymath. He knew more about state and local government than anybody in this country. Uh, he could work in many different uh, channels at once. And what is not normally mentioned, and I've not heard mentioned in any panel or any of the stuff that's been written so far, he was an exquisite moderator and modulator between the forces of the new and the valuable values of the old. One of the great balancing acts he did was between hurting all these young Turks, a lot of whom were in the room, who got drawn into the Lindsay administration, of many of whom he recruited, with the best and the strongest of the traditional civil servants and those two very different cultures. And when you manage change, almost by definition, you have to manage and reconcile two cultures. And when you see shipwrecks, you very often see a shipwreck because the people involved could not manage or didn't even understand they had to bridge two cultures. One of the things Fred did, and all these efforts combining early credibility with momentum about not using the fruits of analysis retributively against the agencies themselves, all these things involve an exquisite balance between undermining the outworn, building on the best of the past, building the new that was stronger and better. Fred was an expert on that. He had a remarkable relationship with the mayor, and I didn't come to fully understand how remarkable that was till I returned in 1975 as Hugh Carey's budget director at the state. And then I learned how strange and important that relationship between a budget director in a period filled with fiscal difficulty and the elected chief executive is. This is a curious thing about American public life, is the relationship between the elected officials, we have a former statewide elected official in the room, and the professional civil, civil service, and the new talent, if there's a wave of new talent. And Fred was the bridge 
between the old and the new, between the elected and the appointed, between Lindsay's desire to manage somehow his way to all sorts of change and the system's capacity to digest and absorb change. And he understood that perfectly and sat at those switches and moderated them. The other thing I said, I said the mayor, the circumstances, the time, the office, obviously the Budget Bureau was a source of power and financial controls. That's a good place to sit if you want to influence what's going to happen. Please remember that. Follow the money. Go find out who's making the financial decisions, the budget decisions, and make sure your reform efforts are plugged in to that voltage line. If they're not, you may have that voltage line operating against you, or you may have it simply go limp on you. So the office, the director of the budget, was right. And then the fourth one, which we also tend to forget, is the extraordinary relationship between a WASP silk-stocking politician and an Irish-American career professional who grew up in Utica, upstate New York of all places, and their absolute devotion and loyalty to each other. It's absolutely amazing. Fred understood what Lindsay wanted to do with the city, never was disloyal to him, and Lindsay somehow understood that a lot of what he wanted to do in the city had to be done through Fred and the Budget Bureau, and the Budget Bureau writ, writ large, and some of the giants who came with Fred and after Fred. <laughs> I guess the last, I'd, I'd close with two other lessons. One is a typical Hayes lesson. When you're doing public policy, it gets forgotten a lot. One of the things Fred taught all of us was, go back to the empirical data. Forget the theories a minute, forget the ideology, forget what you want to believe, forget what you're all hopped up about. Just go back and look at the numbers if you can find the real numbers. And if you can't find the real numbers, then you better know that. So the respect for the empirical before you make crazy policy was something we all learned at Fred's knees. Um, the other one is the emphasis on execution. 99% of what really matters in change is how you carry it through, not how you proclaim it or how you announce it. Conceiving it is important. Executing it is where the real major forces in the war engage. It's where you meet your enemy. It's where the opposition gathers. It's where the undermining takes place. It's where the strength of your ideas and your vision are tested. And it's the battlefield on which you have to mobilize overwhelming forces. I remember describing to the mayor once, and it was at the time we were discussing the, uh, the uh, project management, what was it called, the project management council, the policy management, the implementation. Policy planning council. No, that was the decision, project. but project management. my project management project staff, project thank management you, staff. the implementation, the cur arm. And so I said, we are going to build, Mr. Mayor, something that will give you the ability to get some things done if you will respect the rules of the game. What you have now is a large, transparent plexiglass pipe going through your office. Comes in one wall, goes out the other wall, and in it you see moving at a snail's pace all the city projects and priorities. And what we're going to build will give you the ability to open up a door into that pipe and to pick five and say those are going to move fast. But the rule of the game is you can only pick five. Because if you pay, open up the top to that pipe and get your hand in there and try to move them all, the whole system is going to back up. And that's essentially was the key to the project management staff, was to have a select number of mayoral priority projects that everybody in the government knew was going to be measured. And everybody knew if they screwed around with it or held it up, the mayor was going to hear about it. And he was going to be on their back. Execution, not just policy. Let me talk about John Lindsay for a second. There have been things said about him. Peter was particularly eloquent, as he always is. But I, I, I think that it's, it, why all this happened is because Lindsay came in at a time when the city seemed remarkably tired. Uh, the boom of the 50s is over. Uh, the malaise of the 60s and the problem, the racial tension, the problems are starting. Lindsay's perspective, uh, as well as the press, is the city is falling apart. And that's the, the Murray Kempton poster. He is fresh and, and everyone else is tired. But if you look at the, the, the concrete stuff about it, what does Lindsay find in City Hall? And I've, I found a, 
an old memo in the file about what that first year was like and, and the list of things where mayor gets to his desk expecting to be a commander in chief in some way and has a normal dial telephone. Uh, emergency happens, what does he have to do if he wants to get his police commission? And he has to dial the police department switchboard and ask to speak to the commissioner. So there, there are no direct lines anywhere. Um, David is the master of this, but, but you're trying to figure out a, a, a city construction project. Why, where does a project stand? Why has it taken 17 years still for the police to headquarters to be built, which still hasn't finalized the site? And one reason is nobody has a list describing what the process is to build a building. So the famous 49 steps that David and Meridian and the Budget Bureau laid out, how you have to get a building built is revolutionary in itself. There's no way to track a project because no one knows where it's supposed to go, what the process is. It just all meanders at its own, own pace. Uh, so that, I think the construction control is one of our, one of really our seminal achievements, so it's so obvious it's hard to brag a lot about it. Um, Wagner, we, we did, our tally was that Wagner had 235 committees in existence the day we started. It may well be that at the end of eight years we had 230 committees also, but it's always a good thing to tack the guy who was there before you on. Um, the city had at that time about 200 separate labor contracts. There was no labor relations operation. There was no one, one official who was in charge. The Budget Bureau did it. Sort of it was Harry doing it, but there wasn't a person overseeing labor relations. There was no place we could find all the contracts that no one attracted the negotiations. We created labor, labor havoc, obviously, but we inherited labor havoc as well. Um, I have in my memos one of the things the sanitation department was doing in 1965 was still manufacturing its own batteries at 50 times the, the, the market cost that they could buy them for, for whatever bizarre reason. And of course, there's virtually no computers in the government. Um, there, there is, is a, a very, all the record keeping is pretty manual, which is what these, these guys inherited. The one I knew best was the police department and, and uh, New York clearly is perceived in the country as being way behind the curve. Chicago has the most modern police communications system in the country. New York has until 1964, if you, if you get mugged out in Flushing and want to report the mugging or you're traveling through Midtown, you have to call the local precinct to report the crime. So it means, one, you have to know what precinct you're in at all time. Two, you have to have the precinct telephone number. They're the only people who will record the crime, which is why crime statistics were pretty, pretty uh, terrible, but also the only people who can dispatch a cop to see you. In 1964, that late for the first time, New York City gets a central police emergency number, which is 4401234. You call 4401234, the dispatcher writes down on a little notepad what your complaint is, sticks it in a little metal tube, and just like Macy's in the movies, sticks it in a pneumatic tube and it goes to the, the guy on the next floor. So it is the crudest, most rudimentary uh, system that could have existed. Um, Lindsay comes in, and Lindsay, certainly above anything else, has a profound belief in cities, which is getting lost around the country. It's hard today in this great revival that we're living in in the first decade of the of the 21st century that in the 60s, people are giving up on cities. And Lindsay believes in cities, believes it's central to the country and becomes, becomes a rare articulator of the, the importance of cities to this society and the survival of cities. And he has a vision of cities, which is largely based on a hope and possibility that they can be made but much better. And the key to that, of course, is the ability to manage it better, attracting extraordinarily bright people, different kinds of people, trying all kinds of new ideas, and a very rational approach to what Lindsay perceived as a political management of the city by gathering data and doing analysis. Underlying this is Lindsay's personal belief that <clears throat> the city government is old, it's tired, and it's closed, and closed is particularly important. And the, part, largely because it's controlled by a democratic machine, uh, by a group of institutions that have really gotten corrosive, and Lindsay's personal belief that, that his mission in many ways, more than anything else, is to open up city government, open it up to new ideas, and just as much to open it up to new people, whether they be young people, women, blacks, or whatever. And it, for me, in many ways, that is the... Um, 
dominant theme of eight years of John Lindsay, and in many ways the, the, the profound achievement of, of John Lindsay. Um, and it's done in several ways. It's done on the inside by all of you, by, by, by this quiet data gathering and analysis and program monitor, monitoring, intermediating, as people, Peter says, with the agencies, but it's done in a much more public way simultaneously uh, in confrontation with these institutions. That's partly the strikes, but it's confrontation with unions, with bureaucratic institutions, with party machinery, and the little city halls. A very deep belief, Lindsay, that you've got to break down these walls to bring in new people and new ideas. Lindsay very consciously chose, as his first appointment, cabinet appointment as mayor, to go with the, the purest, whitest department in the city, the fire department, in November 1965 at the Roosevelt Hotel, to the astonishment of the entire government, appointed Bob Lowry, a black um, inspector, to be the fire commissioner of New York. It was unthinkable at that point in time. Uh, it's hard for us today to imagine what a stunning appointment it was, but he did it very clearly to send a message, things are gonna be different. And following that, in a parallel way, in the police department, took the three leading ranking offices, uh, Lloyd Seeley, Eddie Waith, and, and Artie Hill, all of whom had rank, gave them much higher ranks, but gave them serious command jobs, which no black had ever had in the New York City Police Department. Uh, again, another message to the establishment. So this, this was much more than just all of us bright Ivy Leaguers. It was all kinds of people, and it's J.B. Williams and Major O. You know, what's J.B. Williams? He's, he's a He's a lawyer who has an office on the second floor in Fulton Street. Uh, a traditional black lawyer in the 50s had no place to go, was barely surviving. Turns out to be a brilliant manager, a brilliant politician, a brilliant leader. Goes on to run, be the administrator of the court system for years here, but, but a virtuoso and a profoundly wise man who understood, he understood the city more than most. I used to take JB's advice more than almost anybody else. Major Owen's a librarian from, from Brooklyn who goes on to distinguished career in the Congress, et cetera. And, and uh, just went afield at some other odd names, and three came to me last night that were particularly interesting that we don't think of as Lindsay administration, but they all cited proudly in their bios. Uh, one is the current director of the CIA, Leon Panetta, who came here at Lindsay, hired as a refugee after Richard Nixon fired him uh, and sat in City Hall for a year before going back to California running for Congress. Um, no, second is Leon Botstein, the president of, of, of Bard, who's been there 35 years, conducting the American Symphony, who started uh, in the, in the uh, Board of Ed. And third, most interesting, I think, is Chris Patton, currently the Chancellor of Oxford, formerly uh, uh, External Affairs Minister of the EU, Cabinet member, Minister in the UK, whose biography talks about the fact that when he was here on an Oxford Fellowship in 1965, volunteered in the Lindsay storefront and actually got involved in the leadership of the campaign because his English accent, he was allowed to mimic Bill Buckley in some of the debate preparation. Um, so um, let, me, let me then just, let me just switch and go through a, a random array of some of the things by, by kind of category that I think we all achieved and John Lindsay achieved, which in totality, uh, is really remarkable. Uh, uh, Steve, Stephen Goldsmith, who I think is really uh, uh, extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily accomplished and wise person, knowledgeable, obviously has written many books, knows about cities. Uh, I think he's a great, great hire for the mayor and a great gift to the city. Came through the uh, exhibit the other night at uh, uh, the museum and said at the end, uh, uh, I thought I knew a lot about John Lindsay and about this city. But he said, I'm stunned by the, the scope and the depth of what he and you all did and tried to do and by its relationship to what we're trying to do today in City Hall, um, that how, how relevant some of it still is. So what did we do? One, a lot of what Lindsay did was structural change, trying to modernize the government. Put aside the super agency, some of it is so obvious and, and uh, rational, creating the Taxi and Limousine Commission uh, which today is focusing on the taxi of tomorrow, which, which is really all about service and performance. What was it when we came in? It was the hack bureau in the police department, something the cops hated, but all it did was enforce 
It was an enforcement vehicle to beat on drivers. Uh, hated by them. You couldn't get service if you were a passenger, and certainly never worried about things like rates and service and quality of the cabs. Uh, the Parking Violations Bureau, again, taking the, the, the massive volume of just parking tickets out of the court system, which had clogged, wasted, wasted resources, but also was a terrible thing for citizens, because if you had, wanted to dispute a ticket, you had to go down to the taking down to the civil court and wait in line with everybody else, whatever their complaint was. So creating a, a, an administrative tribunal for that, which had long been done in the Federal Bureau 30 years ago, federal government, we did it. The MTA was actually proposed by Lindsay, taken over by Rockefeller and Ronan, created, I'm not a great fan of the way it's structured today because it has no accountability, uh, but the, the notion was really to get a hold of Moses, it was to reverse 30 years of Moses to take the tolls and the revenues from the bridges, the tribal authority, and put them into the subway system. That ultimately gets achieved. Uh, the structure is a little different, and, and Rockefeller's probably right to bring in the, the regional transportation uh, operating agencies, but the fact that the gov no governor wants to be responsible for, for the MTA means it's, it's an orphan agency, which is one of the great problems of living in the city. Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, which, which I had personal involvement with, but it's the first time anywhere in America that someone says, to be fair, in response to a presidential Crime Commission in 1967, which recommends it, but the first time anyone says that the police aren't isolated from the rest of the criminal justice system, that if you want to do something about crime or efficiency, you've got to bring the police, the DAs, the courts all together, plus a lot of other agencies. And in fact, how, how much the world has changed when Lindsay convened the first meeting of the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council of Frank Hogan called the mayor, the distinguished DA of, of Manhattan, said, sorry, Mr. Mayor, I can't go to a meeting with the police commission. It would be a conflict of interest. And the mayor said, well, I don't think it's a conflict. Read the report and all the rest. And uh, Frank said, uh, well, Mr. Mayor, let me ask you, are you, co you convening this meeting as mayor or as chief magistrate? The mayor said, I think as chief magistrate. He said, well, if you're chief magistrate, I have to attend then. But as mayor, I wouldn't come. Uh, the Health and Health Hospital Corporation, which, which was, was not the deal we wanted, not the structure we wanted. Uh, for those of you who were involved, no, but we took the deal, which I'm, I think one could second guess whether we, the state legislature gave us the shell but not the reforms in many ways. Nonetheless, I think begins to allow that system to operate financially very differently. And then, of course, the first environmental protection agency in the country, the first consumer affairs agency in the country, a whole series of government needs which have now been picked up in a lot of places, the first aging, aging agency in the country, and addiction services, the first agency to really combat that with an extraordinary record of achievement and one of the great management performances done by the people who spoke today, and particularly Gordon Chase, who sadly is not with us, but, uh, but uh, along with Fred and others, but Gordon clearly one of the great public managers in, uh, in modern history of, of cities. Then there's technology. Uh, Lindsay's a believer in technology, like Mike Bloomberg, and, and he campaigned in 65 on air conditioning the subway cars, and gets in, calls in the TA, and is told, sorry, Mayor, we can't do it. There's not enough room between the top of the subways and the tunnels. There's no way we can air condition the cars. And the mayor has a very simple answer. I don't think he even had to consult Grossman on this. He simply says, there's no more money for any capital improvements in the subway system until you air condition the subway cars. It's really, we won't buy any more trains until you do that. Lo and behold, the first subway cars, uh, air-conditioned cars, roll out in 1969. There are wonderful posters in, the, in, the, in Lindsay's campaign, but I think it, it really is a, a, a tremendous achievement of forcing the system to air-condition the cars. Similar thing with the police, in which Lindsay calls in Motorola, and we had 100 walkie-talkies, that old style like this, that cops had in 1966. Lindsay calls in Motorola and says, you won't get another nickel from the city, but if you can deliver a small miniature handheld walkie-talkie, you'll get, you'll get an immediate order for 3,300 of them, and they're, they're, every cop has one on the beat by 1969 as well. And by 1969, New York City, no longer trailing Chicago, has the first 911 emergency number in the country, the most modern police communication system, and I think that investment in technology has never left. New York has been a leader ever since. I think Lindsay was just primed for just changing the system in the simplest ways. Um, and there are two that strike me that have not, really don't have much to do with, with a lot of program analysis, data collection, but, but, but common sense. 
The first was that Lindsay uh, was a great friend and fan of the entertainment industry, theater and, and movies as we know, and it heard all this bitching from the, the particularly the, the movie industry about it was impossible to make movies in New York City, which is why in 1964, two movies were shot in New York. Lindsay assigned Barry Goddard as one of his first acts as mayor to go out and find out why this was so. I think it should be clear that Barry was not a member of the Budget Bureau, Barry, but Barry was a reporter. And this, so that he didn't need to gather a lot of data. He went out, did fact finding, uh, does, does what reporters do extremely well, talked to everybody, and came back and wrote what I think remains today one of the simplest, most eloquent reports about a government problem or service you could ever find. Uh, and what it said is there were three problems with doing movies in New York. Number one, you have to get a permit. If someone wants to shoot a movie, you need a separate permit for each location, for each day from the local precinct issued on that day. So if you're going to shoot for 30 days in four locations a day on average, you need 120 permits from different precincts issued that day. Just the cost of doing that is impossible. Secondly, police coverage. The local precinct provides the police manpower who are going to deal with traffic and parking and, and whatever else you need, uh, which I... I don't want to say that it was corrupt, but it's certainly a possible invitation to corruption. Uh, and third, um, of course, the agency whose building you want to use or equipment you want to use got to review the script of the movie. So the likelihood that the transit authority was going to allow the, making of Pel the taking of Pelham 123, which they rejected because of, it would teach bandits how to steal trains, or that the Board of Ed would allow the, up the down staircase showing off or Move, how terrible the school system was, was not. So what are, three simple reforms done uh, in 1967, uh, 40, what is that, 40, 40, 43 years ago. One, a single permit for all movies issued by City Hall, covers as many sites, as many days you want, uh, still the system today. And of course, the city is now trying uh, to do that with, with per multiple permits for small business. Jeff knows all about it. It's a bear of a project it's still going on, much more complicated than this one, but that really has to be the model for the city dealing with co consumers. Secondly, a centralized police unit, something the cops never liked, but it's been profoundly successful. So the same cops go with you for the entire movie. And third, no review of scripts. Uh, net result is by 1967, the number of movies in New York goes from two to 47, then over 100. And of course, it is the greatest industry of all because you don't have to build any infrastructure. There are no buildings involved. They bring everything with them. I should say there were also some union concessions that went along with it, uh, which were important, uh, a great cooperative effort by them. But the same system that Barry designed, the mayor implemented, is exactly in place today, 40, 43 years later and has is, is been copied all over the world. I've been called in the last year by Istanbul and Prague about copying the system. Um, another one which uh, I think is, is profoundly important but doesn't take the Budget Bureau is uh, <clears throat> in 66 when we face our first potential riot in East New York, um, the day, this is, a, this is a clash between Black, black kids and Italian kids over a little piece of land. Uh, a 14-year-old uh, black kid is unfortunately shot and killed. The next day, uh, the first day of reaction, uh, New York City responds. And what does New York City do? It doesn't send in 100 cops or 200 cops. New York, the police department sends in 1,000 police. Don't send them in at 8 o'clock at night, which was the standard practice. But at 8 o'clock at night, when it's getting dark, it's, couple of hundred cops running into community. The cops are terrified. They're going to a strange land. But the community's terrified because invading army. They show up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So they see who's there. Kids and community people can talk to them. They talk to the merchants. Every cop can see two other cops 15, 20, 25 feet away. Third, saturation of officers. Sergeants, lieutenants, captains, everybody can see a ranking officer. The message there is don't make a decision. You're not the decision maker. Someone will make all the decisions. And we're not going to make decisions unless we know we have enough manpower to carry it out, which has lead, led to one of the neocon criticisms of Lindsay that cops have stood around while there was looting going on in stores because they didn't arrest people. And the answer is, if you don't have enough cops to break up the looting without having to shoot someone in the end, we'd rather have looting than people die. Uh, and lastly, an absolute strict policy on the use of force. 
don't draw your gun, we're not shooting. So that, uh, Nick Pelleggi has written that in the Harlem riot of 1964, 1,400 bullets were discharged by the New York City Police Department by rooftops in Harlem, really an astonishing number. In East New York in 1966, not a single shot is fired. Um, this also is not easy to do because both in New York City politically, uh, you know, the unions, the cops, and across the country, all the voices are calling for something else. Don't forget that in 1968, we have a national, a presidential campaign by Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew run on a law and order platform. That is a veiled statement about let, let, let's crack down on those people. In 1967, after, uh, um, in 1968, after Martin Luther King's death, there's looting in Chicago and Mayor Daley uh, issues a statement saying, shoot to, tells the cops, shoot to kill. An hour later, John Lindsay puts out a statement that says we don't shoot children in New York City. Uh, today, there is no police department in the United States that doesn't follow the Lindsay principles of how you control riots. I would submit, for me at least, it's the, most, it's the proudest achievement of the Lindsay years because it goes to the most sacred, difficult power of city government, the use of life and death, of force over people. And I think it also had uh, another profound impact. In 1965 <clears throat> and 66, the New York City Police Department was not particularly highly regarded in the United States. Chicago had the great technology. LA had the great discipline. After 1966, New York became the leading department in the country, set an example which was then accepted by the Justice Department. Every department in America was trained in the New York way, even though J. Edgar Hoover still opposed it. And I don't think New York City ever has stopped from then through ComSat, all the technology and the information system and the management, but New York City has been the leader in police work since then. Uh, the physical city is uh, something profoundly important to the mayor. All mayors make changes in the city. I don't think there has ever been a mayor uh, who had the personal interest in physical development, planning, and design as John Lindsay. Uh, he created the Urban Design Group and attracted uh, a remarkable team of young architects, Jack Robertson, Alex Cooper, Richard Weinstein, Jonathan Barnett, all of whom have gone on to great careers. And then within a year, did something rather innovative, which had all sort of been planned in advance, moved them out into uh, development offices. Times Square, Lower Manhattan, downtown Brooklyn, Jamaica, Staten Island, and the interesting piece of that for me was that, that uh, each of those offices didn't report to, the, to Don and the Planning Commission, they reported to the mayor. Uh, and as much as the mayor loved Don, and Don was, was the person who recruited all those architects for the mayor and was responsible for all this, there was nothing that John Lindsay loved as much as dealing with that part of the government uh, and, and the excitement of that. And the accomplishments, I think, are significant. Uh, Don and that team were the redevelopment of Jamaica, particularly the fight over York College, is, is, is a landmark Lindsay achievement. Uh, the creation of Gateway National Park, the first uh, urban national park in the country. The Secretary of the Interior was there yesterday for the third time this year. It's going to get federal support for the first time. Uh, stopping the Lower Manhattan Expressway, Moses, and then creating the, the uh, uh, Preservation District in Soho. Uh, Donna's team innovative work in the theater district, the, the beginning of the use of zoning for, for incentives for building and the creation of four new theaters, preserve, keeping Yankee Stadium, buildings in downtown Brooklyn, et cetera. Um, in a parallel way, of course, for, for in many ways, the thing that John Lindsay is and perhaps should be most remembered for, and I'll wrap up, is closing of the parks to traffic to allow jogging. And it's so simple, didn't cost a nickel. But, but so symbolic and, and, and so profoundly important to the life of the city. And uh, Don and his team commissioned a, a report from someone in Montreal in 1967 named Van Ginkel, and uh, whose report uh, is worth reading today because he, not, he proposed a mall on 48th Street going across, a mall on Madison Avenue, which is my last great defeat in 1973 that we got voted down in the Board of Estimate, but the mauling of Broadway not quite the same blocks that Jeanette Sadekam has chosen, but the same idea that this street should be treated differently. And it's interesting to me that Jeanette had never heard of this report or seen it until after she did her whole thing. Just shows you that great ideas have a certain uh, life of their own. And, and finally, I think the discussion about decentralization, uh, 
And what we ended up doing was a jerry-built approach. Uh, we, we decentralized some, created these local cabinets, which I think was profoundly important change, gathering people together, a little bit more decision-making of power, but to give it access downtown took commissioners like, like Herb and others and assigned each one to a community. It's not a formal assignment. They went there because of the mayor. And they, so going out once a month, for Herb to go to Jackson Heights once a month and to find out there was a problem in the parks department, that he could either go to Lou, go to the mayor, or call the parks commission and say, hey, I was in Jackson Heights last night and you got a problem out there, clean up this park, was at the end of the day an extraordinarily practical and effective way to link City Hall with communities. And I think this is a the profound dilemma of New York, how we, how we connect the two. I don't have an answer to it, and I know it still, still bothers City Hall, and properly so. There is the question, which I hope the next two panels will talk about, which uh, uh, Jeff and, and uh, Mark and, and uh, Carl, what's the relationship of all this stuff to today? How do you do things, and does it last? Uh, what is the residue? Somehow it all seems to each may reinvents all this stuff. We went through a particularly tough change from, from Lindsay to Beam in preserving some of these things, but I think it's a how you institute. Nothing is permanent, we all learn. Nothing that you do, that you, no matter how dig you deep, except for the third water tunnel, nothing like, will last forever. A lot of what this has all been about is, number one, attracting people and recruiting people. And the amount of time that the mayor and Fred spent on recruitment was astonishing. And the reason all of us and so many other people came was because of that personal involvement of John Lindsay's, and we knew we were working with him. We knew he, he understood and appreciated what we did. Secondly, to inspire us, and that comes not from that first meeting, but from watching what happens after, that we were all inspired to, to stay there, to work that hard, to do these things, because we knew he believed, he cared, he had a vision, he had hope, and he infected all of us with the belief that you could get things done. Third, you had to be support, support financially through the Budget Bureau, um, to port, support within the government intervening, but I think also particularly the willingness to fight for, for your people and to, to be combative, uh, to stand up. A lot of this is political, defend your people when they're attacked, and Lindsay certainly did that, which is also protecting your people. Uh, and lastly, I think most profoundly, um, the right, the ability, the embracing of failure. I mean, we failed all over the place. I probably can list more failures than successes. But particularly for young people, I think it's particularly fragile. And Lindsay's great gift, and I think Mike Bloomberg has a lot of that as well. And I think there's real similarities, not, not in height or, or, or ethnicity or style, but, but, but in some of the principles by which they govern, that Lindsay's willingness to fail and to support you and fail to encourage. I, I was very young, and when I went into the mayor's office one day in early 66, scared to death, uh, and looked up behind that, what seemed like a big desk at a big man, and said, Mayor, I screwed something up. And he looked up over his half class and he said, what'd you do? Uh, and I recounted what, in retrospect, was something terribly trivial. And he looked down at me, leaned back in his chair, roared. He said, go back and do it again, and do it again, and do it again, until you get it done. And for me, as a young man, a profound lesson, but the spirit of that, the tone of it, the acceptance and, the, and the, the inspiration was probably had the most profound impact on my life. And so uh, I thank John Lindsay. I salute Fred and Gordon and all those who are not with us. I salute all of you for the extraordinary work that you did that uh, for those of you in the government that made us all proud and continues to. Thanks Stan and Brooke for letting us do this. This is the conclusion of this segment of the Lindsay Year Symposium in which we've been looking at innovations that were introduced into the operation of New York City government from 1966 through 1973. This symposium is being held at Baruch College and I look forward to seeing you when we return for the next installment of this symposium.